So, as you both know, Mitch McConnell is stepping down from Senate leadership. There are three likely replacements for his job. They're known as the Three Johns, which is Senators John Thune, John Barrasso, and John Cornyn. But I was curious, if there were a fourth John, like a non-Senate John that could replace Mitch McConnell as a Senate minority leader, who, oh who would it be? Who would you pick? I've been thinking a lot about the Johns in the Senate. It's like more than 10 percent of the Senate is either a John or has a John in their last name or is a Joni, which, you know, that may or may not count depending on how you how you do these things. <laughs> what about like a Senate majority leader, John Cusack? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get the boombox out there and just like go for it. Yes. The most earnest member of the Senate. I was similarly thinking Senate Minority Leader John Krasinski, because okay. then he could do like an office kind of bit and kind of like look to the camera on C-SPAN when crazy stuff goes down. <laughs> the side eye. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if he needs to go run a secret CIA op in a foreign country, he could also do that. Many skills. Okay, so before we go any further, let me just do an introduction. I'm Martine Powers. It's Friday, March 1st, and today is The Campaign Moment, our new Friday politics conversation here on Post Reports. So as usual, we have senior political reporter Aaron Blake. Aaron also writes The Campaign Moment newsletter. Aaron, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Martine. And today we also have Amy Gardner, national reporter who is covering voting. Amy, hi. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Okay, so a lot has happened this week. Of course, we have the big McConnell announcement. We have the fallout from the Michigan primary, from South Carolina, a lot going into Super Tuesday, all of which we're going to talk about in this episode. But before we get any further, Amy, I'm curious for you, what is your campaign moment this week? Well, it is in a hotel room in Atlanta where I currently sit uh, (laughs) recording this podcast. I am headed over to the Fulton County Courthouse for a hearing today in the election interference case that's proceeding here in Georgia. It's at one o'clock, so I can't tell you what's going to happen at that hearing yet, but it's an important moment in the case and has big implications for the campaign because it's closing arguments in this big controversy that has beset the case this last six weeks or so, where uh, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and her lead prosecutor on the Trump case, Nathan Wade, are accused of having a romance that predated his hiring and therefore, the allegation goes, constitutes a conflict of interest that should warrant her getting disqualified from the case and the charges getting dismissed. So those closing arguments are going to happen today. We're not going to see a decision from Judge Scott McAfee today, but we might hear some interesting news. A lot of text messages between the star witness against Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade have been circulating around social media the last couple of days that potentially impeach the testimony of Willis and Wade that it's not true that they were dating before she hired him. And I think the larger significance is the impact on the campaign. I mean, you know, you've got these four criminal cases marching forward this year in the middle of a presidential election. And it's just remarkable what the implications could be for the politics of our country. Amy, can I ask an obvious question that I feel like I should know the answer to at this point in this trial? Sure. If Fonnie Willis is disqualified, like, does that matter? Like, how big of a deal is that? Well, they're seeking to have her entire office disqualified. Mm -hmm. And it is a very big deal. And it could scuttle the whole case. It could go away. If she's disqualified. Yeah, I think it's notable that for you, the campaign moment of this week is not what is happening on the actual campaign or upcoming Super Tuesday or the Michigan primary, but is actually what's happening in court. And Aaron, I know that you had a similar kind of take on your campaign moment for this week. Yeah, the Supreme Court taking the Trump immunity case and basically pushing this into a situation where we don't know if the trial is going to happen before the election. There could be a trial before the election, but not necessarily a verdict. You know, we were already in uncharted territory here. But the idea that we could have these very serious charges against a former president and they could win the next election despite not having this issue decided of whether they broke the law and trying to overturn the previous election, even just aside from like – who does this help and, you know, does this increase his chances of winning, you know, is the the lack of a kind of resolution that this could mean 
for the American people. Well, let's get into the timing of all this, because one of the questions it seems like you're asking is not as much, I mean, I'm Obviously, a big question is whether the Supreme Court is actually going to rule that Trump is immune from prosecution. But just how the fact that they are taking up that case is going to delay things further. So those oral arguments are scheduled now for late April. What does that mean for when they'll decide and the effect that that has on the other cases against Trump? Well, basically, there is going to be a hearing in late April. There will be a decision at some point after that. The term ends in late June, so you would expect it to be by late June at the latest. And then, you know, it's basically whatever that says, you know, goes to the district court where the Trump trial is being handled. And there's pretrial motions. There's a lengthy process that takes place there, usually around three months, and all that process is on hold right now. So, you know, you can kind of do the math and think— If this trial does move forward, if Trump is not immune from these charges, you know, you could get a trial starting in September or October at the earliest. You know, uh, the trial could last a long time. It could last past the election. I I think we shouldn't undersell, you know, people are looking at this Supreme Court taking up this case, and there's a lot of complaining on the left about what the Supreme Court's doing, you know, helping him. There's a very real possibility that this trial could be taking place in the fall during the the home stretch of the 2024 campaign and these issues will be front of mind for voters and so i don't think it's i think it's too early to kind of game out exactly what this will mean beyond the fact that we may not have a complete resolution on these things and and that we just don't know a whole lot right now Oh, interesting. So what you're saying is that even though there's a sense among Democrats that this is part of Trump's strategy to just delay, 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 tie these cases up in court, and that that would be good for him, a world in which things are delayed to the point that you have a trial going on in October and early November, that that actually could help Democrats because it's putting the issue front of mind in the moment when people are actually making the decision. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that delay is part of Trump's strategy here, his legal strategy. His team has made that abundantly clear that they would like to push these things after the election. They they argued for those trial dates being after the election when these trial dates were being set. There is so much we don't know, but this is the potential downside of the delay strategy, which is, you know, suddenly, potentially the trial is not being handled in March or in May, but rather in September and October. And that creates all kinds of problems because, yes, if it happens like that, Trump is going to complain that they are putting this trial on at the very moment voters are deciding. And he's made a big show of saying this is all election interference and and things like that. So, you know, there may be reasons why the judges will not want to do that, um, but it's kind of forcing their hand right now. The choice is between having the trial then and not maybe not having him tried on these charges at all because he could potentially try to pardon himself if he wins the election. There's also the question of the left is also angry at the Supreme Court, you know, conservative majority for taking this up on this timetable and not taking it up on an expedited timetable as Jack Smith requested, Mm. I think, in December. But it's worth noting that we don't know how they're going to rule on this. And if you look back to 2020, when people were mad that the Supreme Court agreed to hear that election contest lawsuit from Ken Paxton, the attorney general of Texas, they very quickly ruled against Ken Paxton. They very quickly ruled that they were not going to intervene in the result. And that's also a possibility here, that they're going to come in and say, no, he doesn't have immunity for these actions. He's going to face justice. So it's worth recognizing that we don't actually know how they might even rule on this matter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. So back to Mitch McConnell the three, potentially four Johns, if any of our suggestions are taken up. But that, to me, seemed like a huge moment this week. I mean, just one of those like news headlines that you open and you're like, whoa, I was not expecting this. I'm curious, what was your reaction when the news about this broke? Yeah, I don't know if it was a huge surprise. You know, he's been around for a very long time. So in that sense, the idea that the Republican Senate conference would be head by, headed by somebody not named Mitch McConnell is surprising because he's kind of been an institution there. But, you know, I think if you look at the way the party has been going in recent years, there has been a a clash between McConnell and Trump. There is a growing segment of the Senate Republican conference that is much more aligned with Trump's worldview and approach to politics. And so Mitch McConnell was confronting a situation in which he was clashing with his party on a lot of different issues like foreign aid, uh, like funding the government. 
And so I think in, in a lot of ways it makes sense as a time for him to step aside ahead of the possibility that he would have to serve with a President Trump again, which is not always a very friendly situation for him. And so— And and actually, let me cut you off. Before we go any further, let's play a little bit of tape of Mitch McConnell on the floor of the Senate kind of alluding to that dynamic. I'm unconflicted about the good within our country and the irreplaceable role we play as the leader— of the free world. It's why I worked so hard to get the national security package passed earlier this month. Believe me, I know the politics within my party at this particular moment in time. I have many faults. Misunderstanding politics is not one of them. Yeah, so Aaron, what did you make of that line of of him not misunderstanding the politics of the moment? Yeah, it's interesting because it it sounds in one way like an acknowledgement that he has been overtaken in certain ways by kind of this Trump faction in the party. But I also think it's just kind of a it's time to step aside because the party has moved on. I'm kind of doing this for my party in a certain way because my brand of leadership is not necessarily what they're looking for. And so it's, it's you know, we've seen a version of this from a lot of Republicans who have stepped aside. Uh, when Jeff Flake, the Arizona senator who was very critical of Trump, announced his retirement uh, six years ago or so, he basically acknowledged that he couldn't win a primary in today's Republican Party. Mitch McConnell is a very unpopular figure in the MAGA wing of the party. He has not towed Trump's line on a lot of things. He you know, clearly wanted him out after January 6th, even though he ultimately did not support convicting Trump at impeachment. And so it's a situation where I think it became clear to him that this was a time to go. And don't forget that four days ago, or uh, Aaron will know better than I these details, uh, John Thune stepped out and endorsed Donald Trump, Hmm. obviously knew what was coming. Um, I don't know which of the others have. Aaron, do you? Again, we have the Johns. There's John Thune, the South Dakota senator. There's John Cornyn, the senator from Texas, and then the kind of wild card here, which is John Barrasso, the senator from Wyoming. John Barrasso is definitely the most kind of aligned with Trump of those three. Thune has been pretty critical. John Cornyn uh, kind of argued that his party should maybe go in a different direction in this election. So it creates a very interesting situation where kind of the two, you know, established frontrunners for this job are not very Trumpy. And maybe there's a faction of the party that wants to go in another direction. But the other thing I think is really important to remember here is that the Senate Republican Conference, while the party has moved towards Trump, the Senate Republican Conference has kind of been the exception. It's been kind of a – I think my colleague Paul Kane called it the last bulwark of traditional conservatism, Reagan conservatism hmm. in the party. And so they've done things like on this Ukraine package. And the other thing to remember is this is a secret vote. If these senators feel the need to tow Trump's line publicly more so than they really want to – but they want to get a more established politician who doesn't necessarily tow Trump's line as their leader, they can vote for that. They don't have to be public about that. And so I think that increases the chance of somebody like a John Thune or a John Cornyn ultimately getting this job. Is that who McConnell sees as best, like, continuing to be that bulwark that you described? It's a really good question. You know, John Thune is the number two right now. But prior to that, the number two was John Cornyn. Both of these men have good relationships with Mitch McConnell. I think if to the extent Mitch McConnell wants one of them to have the job, I would imagine that he'll do things at least behind the scenes to try and make that happen. For Mitch McConnell to completely sit that process out would be very un-Mitch McConnell. <laughs> um, so th- this is a, a major choice for the course of the Senate. Is a Senate under a different leader who doesn't necessarily have such a strong conviction about funding Ukraine? Are they going to go to bat for that package like Mitch McConnell did recently. These are really the ways in which this matters. And we've, all, we've already seen the House kind of fall into a, a level of you know, chaos like we've ra- rarely seen. If Republicans are controlling the Senate, or even if they're not, if their conference can't be cohesive moving forward, that does reflect on the port- party more broadly. And I think uh, somebody who's as kind of a steady hand as Mitch McConnell is in lead, leading that party for so long, it does have major implications for what the Senate does ultimately produce and what Congress, by extension, does. Okay, let's take a pause there. And after the break, we are going to talk about Super Tuesday and what to expect. We'll be right back.
All right. So next week, we have Super Tuesday, where roughly a third of the states in the country will be holding their primaries. And at this point, it really does feel like the suspense is, I don't know, non-existent. You know, like on the Republican side, on the Democrat side, we have a very good sense of what's going to happen, specifically with the Republicans. I mean, there are not many remaining paths for Nikki Haley to be the Republican nominee. So I guess with all that in mind, like, does Super Tuesday matter? Like, what what are the actual questions that we're asking here if we know how things are going to turn out? Yeah, Super Tuesday matters. It matters for the same reason that the Michigan primary on Tuesday mattered. It's not that these results are suddenly going to shift and either President Biden or former President Trump are suddenly going to be, you know, having their marches to the nominations in doubt. The key thing, and and if you look at how Haley's talking about these matters, you'll see this in her rhetoric. It's kind of making a point. It's pointing out that there is a large chunk of the Republican Party that is still the Republican Party primary electorate, at least, that's still not on board with Trump and that this creates problems for the party in the general election. So when she got 40 percent of the vote in South Carolina, you know, she said, look, he's a de facto incumbent. How can he be losing this much of the vote? She did a little bit better than people thought in Michigan when she got 27 percent. We've seen in these exit polls that it's not just people voting for Nikki Haley. The vast majority of her voters say that Trump is unfit for the presidency, that they wouldn't vote for him, that he, if he's convicted, he's even more unfit. To the extent these people believe that, to the extent this is a gauge of the party not being totally on board with Trump, it matters when it comes to kind of handicapping and figuring out where things stand ahead of the general election. And so that's kind of what I'll be watching for on Super Tuesday is, you know, now that Trump's nomination is completely undoubted, pretty much, how many people are turning out to cast these protest votes that suggest they just they don't want to see that and that they're they're willing to make a statement about it. And if I could just add, in my home state of Virginia, on Wednesday night, Nikki Haley had an event. And guess who showed up to campaign with her? Susan Allen, the former first lady of Virginia, whose husband, George Allen, was not only governor, but went on to be senator, and whose top political guru, strategist, consultant throughout his career was none other than Chris mm-hmm. Lasavita, who is currently Donald Trump's one of Donald Trump's campaign managers. And so that is a real sign of the times. Wait, 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 connect that for me. Like what is that what is what did that moment tell you? It's a great illustration of the fissures and divisions that Trump's rise in Republican politics in America has created. George Allen was a conservative Republican and he and Chris Lasavita were inseparable for many years and for Susan Allen who was a loyal first lady mm-hmm. and did not make news very often at all. In fact, she, I don't know if you you all are way too young to remember this, but I was actually covering the Allen administration back in the 90s. And I remember when Hillary Clinton got in trouble for that cookies comment, like I'm not home making cookies or whatever. I suppose I could have stayed home and baked cookies and had teas, but I, what I decided to do was to fulfill my profession, which I entered before my husband was in public life. Susan Allen said something very coy and coquettish, like, I don't know what's wrong with making cookies. So like, that's the kind of first lady that she was back then. And so for her to come out and campaign with Nikki Haley Uh to sort of make news and buck the trend of Trump marching toward this nomination, I think is quite interesting and really reveals some of the fissures within the party. And I think that speaks to this question, right, of like, where are those voters going to go after Super Tuesday, right? Like once Haley actually drops out of the race, Because even she hasn't been super clear about this, right, that she says Trump is unfit for office. She also says in the debate, yes, I will absolutely be endorsing Trump if I were to lose. And, like, do voters believe her on that, right? Like, will these be voters who are like, yes, I voted for Nikki Haley because I agree that he should not be president. And now that she's not the nominee, I guess it's okay that he is going to be president and maybe I'll vote for him. Are these voters who are going to stay at home? Are these voters who would ever consider voting for Biden? Like, I really don't know. And I'm, I'm very curious about that. 
Well, and ver- at the very minimum, some of those voters are going to stay home. I mean, that's what enthusiasm does. Mm-hmm. It brings more people out or keeps more people home. So at the very minimum, you're going to see some drop off. It's just a question of whether it's difference making. And that's that's the question of the hour. And uh, it's not a bad segue to talk about Biden because that's the question of the hour for him, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because I mean, what was so notable to me from the Michigan primary and the results from that was that. The, his biggest sh- challenger, essentially, in that primary wasn't, you know, the two other candidates who were theoretically on the ballot against him, but was the uncommitted category, right? And I think uncommitted, like, doesn't really describe what many of these voters were doing. A 100,000 voters, I think more than that, basically saying that they disagreed with Biden's policy when it comes to the war in Gaza and were withholding their vote for him because of that. Yeah, it's a really interesting kind of moment in our politics. It wasn't basically there was a late effort in the Michigan primary led by politicians who are very aligned with the cause of the Palestinians who think that Joe Biden is not sufficiently on that side, that think he's too friendly with Israel. And so with about three weeks to go in the campaign, they signaled that they will tell voters to vote uncommitted in this primary to send that message. They're not voting for another candidate. They're voting for an option that is very evidently a protest vote against the incumbent president. The votes for this were, as you mentioned, a little bit more than 100,000. It was about 13 percent of the electorate, so not a an overwhelming chunk. It's also worth noting that this level of voting for uncommitted is not unprecedented. We saw mm. back in 2012 when Barack Obama was running for re-election in a very sleepy Michigan primary, about 11 percent of voters voted uncommitted. That year, there were uncommitted voters even higher than that in a lot of other states. So this happens. But I think in this case, it was more evident that it was a protest vote because this was so defined as being about that issue. And I think there are so many takes about exactly what that 13 percent of the vote means. I don't think it changes the whole situation for Biden, but it does serve as a reminder of something that does loom for him, which is that – this is an issue that splits his party almost completely in half. Half, you know, half of Democrats are more aligned with Palestinians. Half of Democrats are more aligned with the Israelis. Pretty much any decision that he makes that has some kind of substance to it is going to risk alienating half of his base. And so this was at least serving notice that they're going to try and make an issue of these things and make sure that he knows that they're there. And um, and it'll be interesting to see if the kind of uncommitted or other options – you know, show something on Super Tuesday or if this emboldens members of his party like Rashida Tlaib, who uh, the congresswoman from Michigan who led this effort, if this kind of emboldens them to speak out a little bit more against their party's incumbent president. And it's worth noting that the uh, 13 percent is of the primary electorate, which is a fraction of what the general electorate would be, Mm -hmm. of course. And the question of like how much of this is, for lack of a better word, a bluff, like Obviously, are these voters going to vote instead for the guy who wanted a Muslim ban, you know, eight years ago? Maybe not. Are they going to stay home knowing that staying home will make it more likely that the guy who wanted the Muslim ban will become president again? Like, I think there's a question of, like, how much will that carry through to November? Though, you know, I think it certainly did send a strong message this week. And Democrats who in states with big Muslim populations, notably the upper Midwest, are already coming out and making that exact point, Martine, uh, Josh Shapiro, governor of Pennsylvania, here's what you need to do to win back the Muslim vote, right? Compare what you think Biden's doing wrong with what Trump would do if he was president, what would happen in Gaza if Trump was president. So, I mean, that's definitely a playbook that we're going to see going forward. And, and we see this is basically the same question in both parties. One On one hand, we have kind of this uncommitted thing in Michigan. On the Republican side, we have these voters who are still voting Total for Nikki. chaos. <laughs> <laughs> voting, for, <laughs> voting for Nikki Haley. And, and the question is, yes, how many of them are just bluffing? How many of them will come home when the choice is the person at the top of the ballot? And the vast majority of them probably will come home. But there are going to be third-party candidates on the ballot. Staying home is a very real thing if people just kind of throw up their hands and decide that the choice between the two isn't that different for them. And so all these things matter. It's not just a matter of, well, if these Democrats who voted uncommitted don't like Biden, well, are they going to vote for Trump? No, that's not their only option. It's same thing with uh, Nikki Haley voters. The other option isn't just Joe Biden. The other option is third party candidates or staying home. And so this base enthusiasm matters greatly moving forward. And we'll get another taste for it on Tuesday. 
I I want to throw in <laughs> that I am not the only empty nester in my friend group whose kids have threatened not to vote mm. this fall because you know twenty something kids who don't like Biden and don't like Trump and. The youngs, as I call them, are very much a part of the Biden is supporting genocide by Israel or whatever. You know, they very much buy into that yeah. point of view. That's a great point because the groups that tend to be more on the Palestinian side, young people, black and Hispanic voters, tend to be the very groups that Biden was kind of underperforming the usual Democrat more than any other. And so this is an issue for him. These are these are voters that he needs to make sure are still in the coalition because they're so important. And to the extent this is even complicating that a little, little bit in a very close election, that can matter. I think it's also worth considering what are some of the other issues that are going to come up on Super Tuesday that might have an effect in certain states. I mean, I think it's notable that... Alabama is one of the Super Tuesday states. Alabama currently in this moment with access to IVF. We talked about it quite a bit on last Friday's conversation. But I'm curious if that is going to start to play out in how we see um, people voting on Tuesday. And also we have immigration in Texas. And you had both Biden and Trump on the southern border in Texas on Thursday um, to kind of make the case for what they envision as the future of immigration policy, if they can just have the ability to do what they want to get done. And I'm curious to see if Super Tuesday ends up being a referendum on some of these immigration questions. Yeah, I I think there's a couple things. One is that there are, of course, a lot of states that are voting. Usually in these primaries, we have a good sense of where things stand in a state because there will be a lot of polls that we can look at. That's not the case with Super Tuesday just because there's so many states and they're all kind of just a small piece of the puzzle. So we can be surprised. There could be a state with a character like, you know, Virginia with the northern Virginia suburbs, which are kind of very not Trump Republican. That could surprise you and give Nikki Haley a significant chunk of the vote. Donald Trump in Utah has kind of had a weird relationship with Very conservative, but very Mormon and kind of not very convinced about Trump Republican Party there. So that's a state that's worth watching. Uh, And then, of course, you do have these other factors like immigration playing a big issue in the Texas primary, the IVF situation in in Alabama. I'm not sure how much those are going to necessarily impact a primary vote. But, you know, you have to remember all of these states have very different characteristics, and we could see some very kind of different results from state to state because of the makeups of these states are not the same. And we've we've seen that so far in the, the states that we've had so far, you know. I think the big question here, especially on the Republican side, is, is Nikki Haley going to keep kind of getting that 30%-ish plus, or if it's going to fall away completely, and this is just kind of the dead-enders who are supporting her? All right. So I think we're going to leave it there. Listen, thank you guys so much for being here and for sharing all of these incredible insights. Thank you. Yeah, I actually need to make my way over to the courthouse. Thank you so much, guys. Again, Amy Gardner is a national reporter for The Post, currently reporting from Georgia. We expect that there will be more news from Georgia uh, this afternoon, later today. Um, Amy will be covering it. And Aaron Blake is a senior political reporter and author of the Campaign Moment newsletter, which you should definitely subscribe to. You can find the link to that in our show notes and at postreports.com. That's it for today's episode of Post Reports. Thank you so much for listening. Today's show was produced and mixed by Ted Muldoon, and it was edited by Renita Jablonski. The rest of our team includes Maggie Penman, Rena Flores, Lucy Perkins, Monica Campbell, Alana Gordon, Ariel Plotnick, Bishop Sand, Renny Svarnovsky, Sabi Robinson, Emma Talkoff, Sean Carter, Peter Bresnan, Allison Michaels, and Alahe Azadi. And I'm Martine Powers. We will be back on Monday with more stories from The Washington Post.